Hi guys, in this video we're going to be looking at Kirchhoff's second law, conservation of energy in Kirchhoff's second law, and we're going to finish with a summary. So we've previously come across Kirchhoff's first law, which is to do with the total current in a circuit. However, now we're going to look at Kirchhoff's second law, which is to do with the potential difference in a circuit. Kirchhoff's first law states that the total current leaving a junction in an electrical circuit is equal to the total current entering a junction. So in a circuit, this is what we consider a junction. So it's where we've got one wire or one path and it splits off into more than one path. And Kirchhoff's first law tells us that the current in is equal to the sum of the current out of the junction, which is I1 and I2. So I in is equal to I out. So in this case, we'd write the current in as equal to I1 plus I2. So that's Kirchhoff's first law. So it's related to the total current in a circuit or the total current entering a junction. Kirchhoff also has a second law. Kirchhoff's second law states that in any circuit, the sum of the electromotive forces is equal to the sum of the potential differences around a closed loop. And we can actually write this in symbol form. So we say that the sum of the electromotive forces, which have the symbol epsilon, the Greek letter, is equal to the sum of the potential differences, which we give the symbol V. So this is the symbol form of Kirchhoff's second law. So what we mean by this is the sum of the EMFs in a closed loop. And then sigma V is the sum of the potential differences in a closed loop. And when we refer to a closed loop here, we mean that a closed loop is just a possible path for the current. So for example, in this circuit here, the path of the current is this way. So we say that this is a closed loop because we've got a path for the current to flow through. In a series circuit, there is only one possible loop, but in a parallel circuit, there may be many. So here we've got a parallel circuit. So one loop is to go around this way and go along this junction. And so that's loop one. And then loop two is to go along this junction here instead. So a parallel circuit has more than one route for the current. And when we're referring to Kirchhoff's second law, a closed loop could be either loop one here or loop two. So for loop one, for example, the total sum of the EMFs in that closed loop is equal to the sum of the potential differences in that closed loop. And we're not interested in the potential differences or EMFs in loop one. But of course, the EMF here is the EMF for both loop one and loop two in this particular case. So let's take a look at an example where we can apply Kirchhoff's second law. If we had a single component connected in series with two cells, each with an EMF of two volts, what would be the potential difference across the component? So we've got two cells here. They've each got an EMF of two volts, we've been told. And we want to know the potential difference across this component. So we can do this using Kirchhoff's second law. So our first step is to write down Kirchhoff's second law. So the sum of the EMFs is equal to the sum of the potential differences. Our second step is to write the full equation for the sum of the EMFs and potential differences for this circuit setup. So if we look at our setup, we've actually only got one component. So we can take a look here. So we're only interested in the potential difference of that component. So the sum of the potential differences is just the potential difference of that particular component that we're looking for. So then this is equal to the sum of the EMFs. And we've said we've got two cells. So the sum of the EMFs is going to be the EMF of cell one plus the EMF of cell two. And now our final step is to substitute values for the EMFs into the equation to calculate the potential difference across the component. So we said the potential difference across the component is equal to the sum of our EMFs. So the EMF of cell one 
plus the EMF of cell 2. So now we just need to substitute in our values for these EMFs. And we've been told they both have an EMF of 2 volts. So we've just got 2 volts plus 2 volts. And this gives us the overall potential difference of the component as 4 volts. So that's how we can use Kirchhoff's second law. So now that we understand what Kirchhoff's second law is, we're going to think about the conservation of energy in this law. We can write both EMF of a source and the potential difference across a component in terms of an energy transfer per unit charge. So for example, the EMF can be written as the energy transferred to the charge carriers divided by the total charge of the charge carriers. So as the charge carriers pass through the EMF supply, so for example this could be a battery, energy is transferred to them. Then with the potential difference, if we write this in terms of the energy transfers, it's equal to the energy transferred from the charge carriers. And then this is again divided by the total charge of the charge carriers. So EMF is the energy transferred to the charge carriers per unit charge when they pass through the power supply, so this could be a battery or a cell. And then the potential difference is the energy transferred from the charge carriers per unit charge when they meet a component. So when the charge carriers pass through a component, they transfer energy to the component. So that's how we distinguish between the two. And we can substitute these equations for EMF and potential difference into Kirchhoff's second law. So remember, Kirchhoff's second law said the sum of the EMFs in a closed loop is equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components in that closed loop. So the sum of the EMFs can also be written as the total energy transferred to the charge carriers divided by the total charge. So it's the total energy transferred to the charge carriers per unit charge. And then this is equal to the sum of the potential differences, which we can write as the total energy transferred from the charge carriers per unit charge. So we've got the total energy transferred to the charge carriers and then the total energy transferred from the charge carriers per unit charge. The total energy transferred to the charges in a circuit is therefore equal to the total energy transferred from the charges to the components. So for example, the cells here transfer a certain amount of energy, E1 and E2, to the charge carriers. And then when the charge carriers pass through this component, they transfer energy, E3. So the energy transferred to the charge carriers will be equal to E1 plus E2. And then this is equal to the total energy transferred from the charge carriers. So this is equal to E3, that's the energy transferred to the components from the charges. So the reason we can relate the total energy transferred to and from the charge carriers as equal is because the total energy per unit charge, the charge part is equal in this equation, so they essentially cancel, which is why we're left with just an equation to do with conservation of energy. So this actually means that Kirchhoff's second law is a consequence of the conservation of energy applied to circuits. So we're saying that the energy transferred to the charge carriers is equal to the energy transferred from the charge carriers. So we can see that energy is conserved in the circuits. And the fact that energy is conserved in the circuits comes from Kirchhoff's second law. We can actually derive this from Kirchhoff's second law. But really, this derivation that we've gotten from Kirchhoff's second law is actually just a consequence of the conservation of energy, which is that energy can't be created or destroyed, only transformed from one form to another. So now let's apply this conservation of energy to some examples. A battery with an EMF of 9 volts is connected to a lamp and a resistor. If the potential difference across the lamp is 3 volts, what is the potential difference across the resistor? So the battery here, which is two cells put together, has an EMF of 9 volts. And then we've been told that the potential difference across the lamp, so V across the lamp is 3 volts, and we want to find the potential difference across the resistor. So our first step here is to write Kirchhoff's second law. 
So we've said that the sum of the EMFs in a closed loop of a circuit is equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components in that closed loop. Our second step is to write the full equation for the sum of the EMFs and potential differences for this circuit. So the EMF provided from the battery is going to be equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components. So the potential difference of the lamp plus the potential difference of the resistor. And now our third step is to rearrange the equation to make the potential difference of the resistor the subject. So to make the potential difference of the resistor the subject, we're just going to do the EMF of the battery minus the potential difference of the lamp. And now our fourth step is to substitute values for the EMF and potential difference into the equation to calculate the potential difference across the resistor. So the potential difference of the resistor is equal to the EMF of the battery minus the potential difference of the lamp. Then we said the EMF of the battery is 9 volts. The potential difference of the lamp is 3 volts. So we've got 9 minus 3 volts. So this tells us that the potential difference across the resistor is equal to 6 volts. So now let's look at one more example. Show that in the setup below, if a charge of 1 coulomb moves around the circuit, energy is conserved. So we're using the same circuit. So the EMF is 9 volts. The potential difference across our lamp is 3 volts. The potential difference across our resistor is 6 volts. And we're saying that a charge of 1 coulomb has gone around the circuit. So using this information, we want to show that energy is conserved. Our first step is to write the equation for EMF and potential difference in terms of energy and charge. So we know that the EMF is equal to the energy transferred to the charges divided by the total charge. And then the potential difference, V, is equal to the energy transferred from the charges per unit charge. So this is the energy transferred from the charges to other components in the circuit. So now let's rearrange to get the equations with energy as the subject. So the energy transferred to the charge carriers is equal to the EMF times the total charge, Q. And then the energy transferred from the charge carriers is equal to the potential difference, V, times the charge, Q. So this is the energy transferred to, this is the energy transferred from. Our third step is to calculate the total energy transferred to and from the charge carriers when one coulomb passes through the circuit. So the energy transferred to the charge carriers is going to be equal to the EMF of the battery times the charge Q. So the EMF of the battery is 9 volts and we've been told that the charge Q is 1 coulomb. So this gives us the energy transferred as 9 joules. So this is the, the energy transferred from the charge carriers to other components in the circuit is given by the potential difference of the lamp multiplied by the charge Q plus the potential difference of the resistor multiplied by the charge Q. So the potential difference of the lamp is 3 volts, charge Q we've said is 1 coulomb, then the potential difference of the resistor is 6 volts, and we've said that the charge there is again 1 coulomb, because it's 1 coulomb of charge passing through the whole circuit. So this gives us the energy transferred as 3 joules plus 6 joules, which is a total energy transferred from the charge carriers as 9 joules. So we've got 3 joules of energy transferred to the lamp, so that's the energy transferred to the lamp, and then 6 joules of energy transferred to the resistor. And finally, we just need to show that the energy is conserved in the circuit by equating the energy transferred to and from the charge carriers. So we've said that the energy transferred to the charge carriers is equal to 9 joules, energy transferred from the charge carriers is equal to 9 joules as well. So the energy transferred to the charges is equal to the energy transferred from the charges, which means energy is conserved. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level physics resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revised smiley face and together let's make A-level physics a walk in the park.